You guys are at the hospital. I'm a registered dietitian. We're going to talk about eating for health. Um, and when setting up this presentation, um, Adam had said that one of the things that um, people in the county have concerns about sometimes is cholesterol. So even though we're talking about eating for health, you'll see a lot of things that talk about cholesterol because I tried to really build that in to be one of the focuses also. So learning objectives, understand how food and lifestyle choices affect our health, understand which foods affect your cholesterol, understand the health benefits of a plant-based diet, and know how to easily incorporate more fruits and vegetables into your diet. You guys know where this is going already, I can tell. <laughs> so your lifestyle matters. The World Health Organization estimates that by 2020, two-thirds of all diseases will be a result of lifestyle factors. So when we talk about lifestyle factors, it's not just food, but it's physical activity, um, adequate sleep, stress management, tobacco use, all of those lifestyle factors, but the, one of the main lifestyle factors is poor eating habits. So that's what we'll focus on today. The main health concerns affected by diet, heart disease, cancer, cognitive function, stroke, diabetes, weight management. Um, all of those can be either prevented or progress more slowly with the right kind of diet. So what about my diet? So let's talk about what some of the negative things could be about our diet. So what's newer and kind of really talked about right now is sugar. Um, sugar, uh, it says diets high in, in added sugar and refined grains can increase death from coronary heart disease, increase triglycerides, and affect total cholesterol, cause weight gain, and increase risk of developing diabetes. Um, this is not brand new, but I would say in the last five years is when this has really come to light, when we really started thinking about and talking about sugar. So some sources of added sugar. The number one source um, for Americans where we get our added sugar is from sweetened beverages. Um, so not just talking about soda, which is kind of the obvious one, but Gatorade, um, sweet teas, um, vitamin water, Sovi water. I see you getting ready to check your bottle. <laughs> Um, but a lot of those drinks where we might think they're a little healthier because they're not soda, but they do still have that added sugar. And most of our food, unfortunately, has added sugar. And um, you don't always know that just by looking at the, the label or the name of the product, but by reading the ingredient list, they have some tricky names. So like up here, dextrose, fructose, honey, maltose, molasses, sucrose, nectars, and there are more. And those are just some of the words they use in the ingredient label to tell you that there's added sugar to that product. Um, Something cool that's coming out though is in the next three years we're supposed to be getting brand new food labels. And on the new food labels it'll actually say added sugar. So it, right now it just says total sugars and that can include natural sugar, which natural sugar is not what we're worried about here, it's the added sugar. But in the new food labels it'll specify the total sugar and then separate out the added sugar. So that'll help us a little bit more as opposed to having to always read the label and look for those keywords. Sources of refined grains. Um, cause refined grains when we eat them they break down our body they turn to sugar so that's why they're kind of grouped in here with the sugar the refined grains are the white breads so regular bread bagels english muffins croissants any of those types of products white rice crackers made with white flour and sugar and baked goods so cakes brownies cookies donuts any of those types of foods the recommended amount of added sugar is 25 grams per day for women and 37.5 grams per day for men. Um, I do think it's beneficial to just like for one day count up and see where you're at for added sugar. Um, I mean if you tend to have a granola bar in the morning for breakfast and maybe you have a soda in the afternoon to get you through the afternoon sleepies, you very easily could be over that grams per day. Um, it's surprising how much sugar is actually in our foods that we're not expecting it to be in there. When we're not expecting it to be in there. What else about our diet? So saturated fat. This one's a little more common. We've been talking about saturated fat probably for 20, 30 years. Um, but saturated fat does increase risk of heart disease. It increases total cholesterol and the LDL cholesterol. In case you are not remembering, the LDL is what we say, quote unquote, is the bad cholesterol. Sources of saturated fat, all animal products, palm oil, coconut oil, cocoa butter, and chocolate. So when I talk about all animal products, it's not just meat, but also dairy. Um, so like your cheese, your milk, your ice cream, anything that comes from an animal. And um, um, coconut oil, I like to point out here, because there's a lot of um, 
um, articles and stuff in the media about how good coconut oil is for us. And um, there's, I mean, if you want to break it down, we could have conversations about medium chain triglycerides and long chain triglycerides. We're not going to get into that today. But what it boils down to is that coconut oil is a saturated fat. So if you are going to use coconut oil, you still want to use it in moderation and be careful with how often you're using it and how much you're using. Um, and then the chocolate. I know that one makes a lot of people sad. <laughs> Dark chocolate does have some um, actual heart health benefits. Uh, and we're talking like 70% or higher for dark chocolate. So a little bit of that occasionally, um, but especially like the milk chocolates and the things that are more popular, you wanna try and stay away from having too often with the saturated fat. Recommended amount of saturated fat, 10 to 15 grams daily, and that's a maximum. So if you can have less than that, that's always good too. And then the last, what about my diet? Um, trans fat, again, something that's talked about a lot, um, at least for the last 10 years. Um, Margarine got a big hit for always having trans fat in it and being bad that way. Um, trans fat increases your risk of heart disease, increases total cholesterol, increases LDL cholesterol, and lowers your HDL cholesterol. So HDL cholesterol, again, is that quote unquote good cholesterol. We want it to be higher, and trans fat lowers that. Sources of trans fat, deep fried food, margarines, baked goods, chips, crackers, etc. Um, the reason why we say et cetera there is trans fat is usually used and it was kind of invented to help extend shelf life. So anything you're buying on the shelves has the potential to have trans fat in it. Uh, you can read the label and see if it has trans fat in it because usually it'll have your total fat and then it'll break it down if it's saturated or unsaturated or trans fat or whatever. But the tricky thing with trans fat is that if there's less than 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving, they can write trans fat free on the label. So for example, if your food item has 0.4 grams of trans fat per serving, and you eat four servings of it, you just had 1.6 grams of trans fat and you thought you had none. So the key words are where it started there, the partially hydrogenated oil. Again, with the trans fat, you're gonna wanna read your label. Uh, read all the ingredients, and if it says partially hydrogenated oil, doesn't matter what kind of oil, it means it has trans fat in it. Recommended amount is less than two grams a day. And trans fat is one of those where if you can just avoid it completely, it's not doing you any good. So just avoid it completely if possible. <clears throat> so here's a picture of some of those foods we just talked about. Some people might think that they look good. I think they look kind of blah. They're all like the same color. They're all like yellow and tan and ugh. Except for the colored cans of soda, of course. Well, look how beautiful that picture is. Ooh, that's a gorgeous picture. <laughs> so just a couple of quotes that I really like. Um, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food by Hippocrates. And I actually don't know the author of the other quote, but I've heard it a few times, and it's healthy eating is the foundation of treating and preventing disease. So we talked about some food and how it can negatively affect us, and so now we'll move into what kind of foods do we want to eat that are going to positively affect us. First, I want to ask, when you, when somebody talks about healthy eating, what is some of the first things that you think about? Okay. Anybody else? Vegetable greens. Greens, yep, yep. The colors, yep. So those are all good things. So portion control is huge. I, I'm sure we've all heard of portion distortion. Uh, we've talked about that over the years. Um, but greens and the colors, like this, Last picture, you know, if it's colorful, you're eating all those different colors, you're getting all those, uh, that variety of nutrients and vitamins and minerals. So um, the Mediterranean diet. So the reason why I bring this up first is we talk about greens, we talk about colors. If you look at that bottom food section, hold on, I got a pointer. If you look at the bottom food section, that's what it is. It's your fruits, your vegetables, it's your colors, your whole grains. The Mediterranean diet is a plant-based diet. The Mediterranean diet has also been researched for over 30 years. And it has been proven to aid in weight loss, provide cancer prevention through its anti-inflammatory properties, help reduce the risk of cancer reoccurrence, and reduce your risk of heart disease and diabetes. So it has a lot of benefits to it. I also want to point out, because um, we did talk about lifestyle at the beginning, and it's not just what we eat, but you'll see that the very bottom of that pyramid is physical activity. So it's the Mediterranean diet really focuses not just on what you eat, but also that physical activity that goes hand in hand with it. And so my bullet point can change your DNA. I actually just learned this about two months ago, and it's one of the coolest things I thought I ever learned. So they did a study 
and I believe it was called the Nurses Health Study. They followed, oh gosh, thousands of women. I think it was 18,000 women maybe. And they followed them over like 20 years. And they recorded all their habits, their physical activity habits, their eating habits, everything. And what they realized at the end of the study is that the women who followed a diet that mostly, um, that mostly looked like the Mediterranean diet, their DNA was actually different. And the women who followed a diet that was higher in saturated fat and more of kind of a typical American diet, had um, their DNA was different. The, ch the difference between the two of them is the DNA for the women who followed the Mediterranean diet, um, the, the telomeres on their DNA, that means not a lot to me when I say it like that, but just so you know where it's coming from. <laughs> the telomeres on their DNA was longer and that meant they were gonna live longer. So following the Mediterranean diet actually expended, um, extended their life expectancy. It was only, they estimated about three to five years, not 15, 20 or anything like that, but um, it still is pretty amazing how food can really affect us on that level. One of the big things about the Mediterranean diet is the fish. Um, Let's go back for a second. You'll see that the second level up is fish and seafood, and that your red meat and your pork are way up at the top. So fish is their big meat source. So we talk about omega-3 fats. The omega-3 fats are associated with a lower risk of heart attacks and benefit the heart by lowering triglycerides, increasing your HDL cholesterol, blood thinning anti-inflammatory properties, and blood pressure control. The number one way to get that omega-3 is through the fish. The fatty fish that are listed up here um, when we talk about bioavailability, when we eat that fish, our bodies will absorb a whole bunch of the omega-3 um, fatty acids. But if you don't like fish, there's also the plant source. So the flaxseed, the walnuts, the canola oil, soybean, soybean oil, and fortified foods, those also provide us with omega-3 fats. Um, our bodies don't absorb quite as much benefit from them as it does the fish, but you're still getting a good source of omega-3s. So, I say if you like the fish that are listed there, eat it, you're going to get great benefit. If you don't like those fish, at least try to incorporate some of those other plant-based foods with the omega-3s into your diet. And the pictures I have on the bottom, it's salmon, flaxseed, walnuts, and soybeans. After the fact, I thought they probably didn't look very clear, but I just want to let you guys know. <laughs> so the Mediterranean diet, it's a plant-based diet, it has all of those health benefits. It focuses on um, fish for the meat source, and the fish is where we get that omega-3. Um, I have a recipe. So I have a recipe from the cookbook that's shown there, and that's just the ingredients. I do have the actual full recipe. If anybody's interested, you're not required to take it or anything. But I just wanted to show an example of a Mediterranean diet um, recipe or meal. Um, it has beans. It's going to have fresh herbs like the mint. It's going to have oregano. It's gonna have a lot of garlic and onion. That's typical. Um, olive oil, a lot of the recipes have actual olives in them or goat cheese. That's typical for Mediterranean type recipes. So let's say, uh oh, my clicker's not working. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, <laughs> so let's say that um, you like the idea of the plant-based diet and you like the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet, but you're like, I don't like olives, I don't like goat cheese, I'm not familiar with these herbs. Um, some ways that we can still eat and get those health benefits. So a plant-based diet, but more Americanized foods. You can still do a plant-based diet without focusing on those specific vegetables. Um, in Wisconsin, we eat a lot of green beans, carrots, we have squash this time of year, um, beets, broccoli. I mean, there's lots of vegetables out there without it having to be Mediterranean specific. It says vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, beans, and fruits um, are the base of all meals. Again, it doesn't have to be those Mediterranean foods. You just want that to be the base of your meal and not having the meat be the base of your meal. Foods high in omega-3 fats on a weekly basis. Uh, minimal of any red meat, small amounts of dairy, and you still get the benefits of reducing your risk of heart disease, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes. So the Mediterranean diet, I like to talk about it because it's widely studied. It has um, proof that it does these great health benefits for us, but I get that it's not for everybody. So how to start adding more plant foods to your diet? Starting small. Um, bag of frozen vegetables with supper nightly. If you don't always have a vegetable with supper, that's the easiest way. There's not gonna be any salt or anything added to it because it's frozen. 
They come in the steamable bags, you throw it in the microwave for four minutes, boom, you have a vegetable at supper. If you're not a vegetable person and, you, and you're gonna start out by putting a little butter or margarine on it or you're gonna put a little salt pepper on it, those are not exactly habits that you wanna continue with, but if that's how you're gonna get started, that's okay. Let's get started getting some vegetables into our diet and then we can modify from there. Going meatless one night per week. Meatless Monday, sometimes people hear about. Um, but any night of the week, and if, again, if you need to start small, if, if you're in a household where it's meat every single night and you're gonna start out with grilled cheese and tomato soup as your meatless night, great. Just get your one meatless night in and then you can build on that and you can move on from there. Make vegetables a daily snack. So it's not just about our meals that we wanna have more of our plant-based foods, but also at snack time. So if normally you're doing um, cheese and crackers for a snack, you could do carrot sticks and a piece of cheese for a snack. Um, if you'd like to do, um, or let's go back to your cheese and crackers, you could do crackers dipped in hummus. That would be adding a vegetable to your, to your snack. Getting vegetables into our day. Um, try and do one, one new vegetable a week. I had mentioned the popular vegetables in Wisconsin, the green beans, the carrots, the corn. Um, maybe you're in a house that you eat broccoli three times a year. Let's do broccoli for a week. Try cooking it different ways. Try adding different seasonings to it. See if you can find a way that you love broccoli or beets or winter squash or whatever the vegetable might be that you're not used to eating. Make vegetable dips like hummus, bob ganoush, and some others um, like tzatziki spread. Um, again, if, you're, if you do maybe eat your carrots at snack time, but you're just eating them in ranch dressing, maybe you can now eat them in hummus. That way you're adding another vegetable to your snack. And choosing whole grains. So we talk about a plant-based diet, so I'm gonna talk a lot about vegetables because they're, the, they're what we really want to be the base, but we can't forget about our grains. So your whole wheat bread, or if you like to do bagels or English muffins or any of those other um, bread products that I mentioned before, just choosing the whole wheat version of it instead of the plain white version of it. Brown rice, whole grain pasta, they now have um, garbanzo bean pasta, if you're not crazy about the whole wheat. Um, so you're actually getting um, the extra fiber and protein from the bean in the pasta. Swaps, tips, and tricks. So adding extra vegetables to soup. So if you normally make a traditional, let's say for example, um, chicken noodle soup, usually the traditional vegetables are just celery, carrots, and onions. You can add green beans, you can add corn. You can um, cook up some cauliflower and puree it and make it a creamy um, vegetables or uh, chicken noodle soup. Uh, you can do the same thing with white beans. White beans can be added to almost anything. They're gonna take on the flavor of whatever you're cooking and you're not gonna actually taste that bean. You can puree them to thicken soups or, or stews or casseroles. You can just add them into a casserole. Maybe you have a little meat in that casserole, but you wanna cut back and do half the amount. Add in some white beans, they'll take on the flavor of the casserole and you're still getting the extra fiber and the nutrients from it, but you're not even able to tell that they're there. Using beans or lentils in place of meat. For some people, this is the easiest way for them to start their meatless, meatless night of the week. Um, and tacos is a really common one. A can of black beans, throw it in the pan, add your taco seasoning just like you would your meat. And now that's your base for the taco instead of ground beef or whatever you might be using. I have meat in quotes, loaf. Um, you can use beans or you can use lentils and you can form what would look like a meatloaf. Season it like you would a meatloaf and you can have that also. Adding spinach or kale to smoothies, anybody do this already? It's kind of a more common one. So that's an easy way to get an extra vegetable and if you do like a fruit smoothie, usually you can't taste it. And I wrote even chocolate ones because some people think that that sounds weird but you put your spinach in your chocolate, protein shake or whatever it is, it's gonna change the color but you can't even taste it. All you're tasting is chocolate. So it's an easy way to get more vegetables, more nutrition into your diet. And shred vegetables and mix with traditional meat dishes. So I have two examples. Um, shred some zucchini, mix it up with your ground beef or ground turkey before you make your burgers. Same thing with a meatloaf. You could do the zucchini or you could shred some carrot and mix it in just to add more vegetables to your diet, more plant-based foods. Um, the zucchini is really great because zucchini is like the white beans. It's gonna take on the flavor of whatever you're cooking. So you can shred zucchini and put it in anything. Um, the last time we made meatless tacos at my house, it was black beans, sweet potatoes, and shredded zucchini. My kids don't like zucchini. They couldn't even tell it was there.
But if I was to cut up big hunks of zucchini and put it in the oven and expect them to eat that, they're not going to touch it. But the zucchini will take on the flavor of anything that you mix it with. My son even had a friend over and he liked them. I'm like, hey, winning recipe. <laughs> so a recipe um, that is a little bit more what I would consider Americanized, um, but it's plant-based. You're still getting those benefits from the plant-based diet. And again, I have a copy of the full recipe. It came from the cookbook that's pictured there. And um, it's for lentil sloppy joes, but it has more of those traditional American foods. And then the cheddar and broccoli stuffed sweet potatoes, same thing. Um, sweet potatoes, broccoli, cheese, those are pretty common for us usually here in Wisconsin. What I like about some of these recipes though, the, like the cheddar and broccoli and um, stuffed sweet potatoes, that could be just a meal for me, but my husband might think, ah, oh, that's not quite enough. That's an easy way to add lots of vegetables to your meal and then I can throw a piece of baked chicken on the side for him if I need to. Or maybe your plan was to do um, pork chop, mashed potatoes, and green beans. Well, instead of the mashed potatoes, do this. So now instead of potatoes and green beans with your pork chop, you now have sweet potatoes, broccoli, green beans, and there's actually black beans in this recipe. So now you're having four vegetables with your meal instead of only the green beans and the potatoes. So it's not always about completely changing our meal, but just seeing what we can add to it. And so the last slide, eating for health, let's make it fun. So what you choose, choose to eat does truly matter. Like we said, the Mediterranean diet actually affected those women on a DNA level. Um, and what the World Health Organization said about by 2020, two third of our diseases are gonna be, um, be because of our lifestyle choices. What we eat truly affects what we are, how our health is. Um, have fun with new recipes or ingredients. It doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be work to try and add more plant-based foods to your diet. Um, you could grab one of the recipes I have here or Google and find your own recipe, make it. Maybe it sucks. Maybe you don't like it. That's okay. You learn maybe a new cooking principle that you can now change and put some different ingredients in that you know you like better, but you can build on that and you can have fun with it. Um, involve the whole family. If you're cooking for a spouse or if you're cooking for kids, sometimes just throwing something new on the table isn't always their favorite. <laughs> so you can incorporate or you can involve them. Ask the kids, would you rather have this or this? And sometimes just by getting, being able to pick something, even if they're not sure if they'll like it or not, is enough to get them to want to try it and not complain about it as much. Um, or maybe they want to help you cook. Cooking is a skill that we gotta learn, so maybe they wanna help you cook it, and you wanna bring them into the kitchen with you a little bit more. Um, it's a balance, don't stress out. So uh, we wanna talk about incorporating more fruits and vegetables and whole grains. We wanna have that plant-based diet for our health. But then it's Susan's retirement and there's cake in the break room. It's okay, it's okay to have that occasional piece of cake. I know people have heard about the 80-20 or 90-10, um, what that boils down to is you just want the majority of the food you eat, the majority of the time, to be that healthier, more nutritious choice. And when in doubt, ask a dietitian. So um, if you're trying some new things at home and you really want to make some changes but you're struggling, you're not sure what to do, or you can't get the family involved or on board, or you just feel like you need help or somebody's opinion or a suggestion, reach out to a dietitian, that's what we're here for. Um, at the hospital, we have the Diabetes and Nutrition Center where you could meet with them and set up goals and maybe meet with them two or three times over the course of a few months to um, kind of make some changes to your, to your lifestyle and to your eating habits. Or maybe you just have a quick question and you just want somebody's opinion on it. I have my cards that I'll leave and you can send me a quick email and I can just give you my opinion on some question you might have. But when in doubt, dietitians are here. <laughs> so that is actually all I have for slides. Um, like I said, I did bring those recipes, and I also wanted to mention that I brought both of these cookbooks that I have those recipes from. I'm not affiliated with them. I don't get any benefit from you liking them. I just think they're really great cookbooks, so I wanted to bring them for you to take a look at if you wanted to. Any questions? Here's your chance to ask a dietitian. <laughs> <laughs> So like, if you go to the store, you say you try a new vegetable every week. Mm -hmm. I want to try a new vegetable, but I don't know how to cook it. I don't know how to, what, what to put them in. I mean. Excellent idea, or excellent question, I mean. 
Um, so there's always Google. And I would even just start there and say, you know, how do you cook Brussels sprouts? And maybe it says to roast them. Well, you know, I'm sure you can also boil something. You can also grill it. You can, I mean, we know how we cook our other foods. So maybe start with roasting. You don't like it. Try one of the other ways of cooking that you already know you like. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm talking some of the extreme vegetables. I mean, I don't have a clue what to do with, say, I don't know, kohlrabi or okay. whatever, you know. Okay. Yeah. A lot of times, um, just kind of as a rule of thumb too, uh, as a rule of thumb, if it's something like, if it kind of looks like a potato, you can kind of cook it like a potato. Um, so like a kohlrabi or a rutabaga or something like that, uh, they kind of, when you peel them, they kind of look like a potato. Look, you can cook them kind of like a potato. You can try that. Um, or if it's uh, really like stiff, dark green, often you're gonna wanna add some tangy and some sweet to it. And you can choose, that might be cranberries and some like lemon juice, a tangy and a sweet. I mean, you can choose what tangy and sweet you want, but those are just kind of some general principles for some of those foods. Um, trying to think of something else. Yeah, throw another vegetable at me because now I'm drawing a blank. I know, I, was like, <laughs> I mean, I've tried eggplant by grilling it Kids mm -hmm. didn't like it, so then I just gave up. I never thought about roasting it or, yep. you know, what else. Yep. I mean, you don't want to deep fry it. But <laughs> <laughs> so you can try roasting it. Um, and some of those vegetables, too, if you've grilled it, if you've roasted it, and, like, just the family's not happy with it, those are usually the vegetables that I say chop it up small and throw it in a casserole. You're still getting the nutrition. You don't have to taste every bite of it, but you're still getting that nutrition from it. Spaghetti squash is really good. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you can use it just like a noodle, or you can use it as a side dish, as your vegetable. Absolutely. Any other questions? All right. Thank you.